Let's take our Bibles and look together in Lamentations chapter 3. And my text for this message is going to be from verse 1 down to verse 26. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 1 down to verse 26. Lamentations is a book that was most likely written sometime between 586 and 516 B.C., before Christ. It would have been sometime after the destruction of Jerusalem. Isaiah had prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple 150-some years beforehand. That's how long he lived before Jeremiah. But now Jeremiah himself actually lived through the destruction. And so the book of Lamentations is about that destruction and the desolation that came as a result of the Lord bringing his judgment upon that city and that people. It's interesting how this is written because it's written actually as a dirge, a song of sorrow. And it is one of the poems that we find throughout this book, this one actually being the third, but it's significantly different in structure from the others because it's made up of single lines grouped in threes. You may have a Bible where it lays it out that way. Here in my edition, it just lists one verse after another. And you can see the number of verses that there are. You wouldn't have time to go all the way through the 66 verses in this message. That's why I want to focus primarily on the verse 26, but speak to you about God's faithfulness. Here's Jeremiah. He's lived through what God said he would do, bringing destruction by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And very likely that he wrote this from Egypt. He was captured and held ransom and taken down to Egypt by some that had lived through the destruction, even though the Lord had told them not to go down to Egypt because he said he would direct Nebuchadnezzar down there to destroy Egypt, and any that sought refuge in Egypt would certainly be destroyed. You don't run to false religion in the time of trouble. You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But in the Hebrew Bible, to give you an idea of what this would look like, in the first three verses, they all start with the Hebrew letter Aleph. It's like our A, only in Hebrew it's Aleph. And then the second three verses would be Beit, B-E-T-H, and so forth, all the way down through the 66 verses. That's why there's 66 verses, because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So each one of the verses grouped in threes would add up to 66. But what I want us to see here is the faithfulness of God. When you consider, and this is really what Jeremiah is describing in this portion of scripture, where he was spared while others were destroyed. And I know for myself, I marvel that it pleased the Lord to reveal Christ in me. Why me, Lord? That would be the question. Someone has said that God has hedged us about on one side with his mercy and his grace lest we despair and yet on the other he's hedged us about with warnings lest we presume and that's certainly what we find here in this portion we find promises and yet we also find warnings and so the question is where is our hope what is a true hope everybody has a hope 
But what's a good hope? Well, a good hope would be that which God gives to those that he has chosen. And in this context, those for whom Christ would come and pay their sin debt. Jeremiah, just like Abraham and all those of the Old Testament, were given the spirit to look forward to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in which would be their redemption and their justification. They lived under the forbearance of God, which simply means that God in his love did not charge them or condemn them for their sin because he purposed to lay it on Christ as a sin bearer when Christ would come. We know that we can do nothing in ourselves to please God. And so the question is, how can any of us have any hope? Well, the answer is, it's in God's faithfulness, first of all, to his son. When John wrote that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, faithful and just to forgive because of Christ. He's faithful and just to his son. And therefore, we're not consumed. So our hope is in the Redeemer. And here in the first 18 verses of this chapter that I want to read now, Jeremiah is speaking as a man afflicted of the Lord. But as I read what he wrote here, I see in him even a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to bear the sin of his people according to the will of his father. So when he says here in chapter 3 and verse 1, I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Read these scriptures in view of Christ. Jeremiah was a prophet, but he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He represented God in that generation with that people. And certainly everything he wrote here could be said of our Lord Jesus Christ. He had led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. When the Lord came to bear the sin of his people, he was brought into the darkness of this world. In fact, he told those that came to arrest him on the eve of his crucifixion, now is your hour. This is the hour of darkness. Notice, surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. We know that no bone of our Lord's was ever broken, but it's speaking here of the crush. When it says in Isaiah that it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that's the word to crush, to run through the mill. It's like you take wheat and you run it through a stone mill. It crushes up the wheat. That's a picture of how Christ is the bread of life. He came and the seed was sown, it died, and from that the wheat came forth. It was cut down and put in the mill and crushed. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. Don't the scriptures speak of the travail of his soul, whereby the Father would be satisfied? He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. We can't even comprehend what it was for the Lord Jesus Christ to bear the sin of his people. Here Jeremiah is representative of what it was to bear their transgression, their iniquity because he's seen the desolation of Jerusalem with his eyes, lived through it, was himself pursued and persecuted by those that hated his word that he preached. And so it's a type and a picture of what it is to have the hand of the Lord literally heavy upon him, like a heavy chain, it says there. Also, when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. 
And we know that our Lord was heard in every way in which he cried unto his Father. And yet it was as if the Father was silent to his cries. That's how people interpreted it when he cried from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me or left me is in, in this state would be a better way perhaps to, to say it there in Psalm 22. It appeared to those that were, that were around the cross that he was crying. They thought even he was crying unto Eli because he was actually crying in the Aramaic. And uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani is the way that that stated. Why hast thou forsaken me? But our Lord was not forsaken of his father, even as here it appeared that as Jeremiah cried that the Lord had shut out his prayer. It was that God purposed that things be exactly as they were. And when he cried, why hast thou forsaken me? He never turned his back on his son. But the question is, why did he leave him there being the son? Well, a few verses later in Psalm 22, it says, For thou art holy. It was necessary that Christ hang on that cross as he did, and that his prayers and his cries unto the Father, these weren't necessarily outward physical cries of moaning and groaning. We do know that there were seven different sayings of Christ from the cross, but none of it was in bitterness against his Father. It was in submission to the Father. Even as we read here with Jeremiah, I believe he's praying by the Spirit in submission to God for what he endured. It says, He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. Think about our Lord Jesus Christ being the just one and yet coming to bear the sin of the unjust. That sin was laid upon him. Notice it says he hath made my paths crooked. He doesn't say he's made me crooked. There was no sin in our Lord Jesus Christ. And here Jeremiah is just simply speaking of the way that he was to walk that God had purposed even for him as his prophet with many twists and turns and wanderings. As sheep were prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. <clears throat> and so our Lord walked that path on behalf of his sheep. And here Jeremiah presents God as being an adversary in every way. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. You can see how Jeremiah is expressing the affliction that God laid upon him. But what must have been also the thoughts and cries of our Lord Jesus Christ as he bore the sin of his people when it says, I was a derision to all my people. Our Lord endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. It says, He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Those are terms that are used to describe the sufferings of Jeremiah, but more particularly the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, He also has, has broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. Christ was purposed to be a burnt offering. And so even here when he describes his teeth being broken with gravel, not literally, they didn't bust out Jeremiah's teeth, nor did they with the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's a, a figure to express pain. And even to the point of not being able to take food, 
if your teeth are, are busted, it's like being obligated to eat small pebbles till all the teeth are broken in pieces. And one can hardly read that without feeling the pain. Any of us that have had even a toothache, we understand even that pain, but more so here it had to do with what the Lord would bear spiritually on behalf of his people. It says, and thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. This is one thing for Jeremiah to say this, but it's another to think about our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the world. And yet coming down and taking on flesh, what that stoop must have been like, infinite taking on finite. And him bearing the sin of his people in his soul. He was without sin. And yet as a sin bearer, it was the travail of his soul that would satisfy God the Father. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. I don't know as we can understand just how great was the weight which our Lord endured in his soul, even as one that would be left without hope, and yet we know he was not. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. So again, it's impossible to read this with regard to Jeremiah and not see a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here in verse 21, he says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. When the Lord tells us to hope in him, he's speaking as the forerunner. He understands what it is to bear affliction. He understands what it is to be the forerunner, to go before. Scriptures say that he was tempted in all things, yet without sin. And so as we address to him our afflictions and our trouble, and that's where we're to cry unto him, he answers as one who's already been there. Don't you like to talk with somebody that as you bear your heart to them, they tell you, I understand, I've been through a similar experience. And you can kind of just sigh and take a deep breath and say, well, tell me about it. Here, when Jeremiah says, this I recall to mind, what does he recall? He's not recalling any works of his own or any reason for which God should show favor to him. No, he's recalling God's grace toward him. And we know that the sin that the Lord bore for his people it didn't affect his being. He didn't become sinful in that. But he rested as much as any one of us must rest on the grace of his Father and the strength of the Spirit upholding him and his love and mercy. And here Jeremiah then would be looking to Christ as he shouts here these words in verse 21, therefore have I hope. Underscore that. There's hope in the Lord, but it's in the Lord only. And that's where here in verses 22 to 26, I come now to the core of this message of God's faithfulness. How is it that we can hope in the Lord? Well, it's because God is faithful. And He's faithful, first of all, to his son, but he's faithful to those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ is the representative. So we find hope even in reading this particular portion of Scripture. So here in verse 22 is the first. There's six ways that are described here in verses 22 to 26, whereby we as the children of God find hope. First of all, he says in verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. 
That's how God's faithfulness is reflected toward those for whom Christ came and paid the sin debt. He's faithful in his mercies. And because he's faithful in his mercies, notice it's in the plural. It's not a one-time mercy. Okay, I'm done. Don't come back for more. No. Continual, it is the Lord's of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. In David's psalm there in Psalm 51, David is not asking the Lord for justice because he knew that if justice were rendered, he would have to be condemned, but he pleads for mercy. You can look at it there in Psalm 51. And I believe this is how we look to the Lord. It's because he's faithful in his mercies, not for anything in us, but for Christ's sake. And David certainly is a testimony of that, particularly in this psalm, it says when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba and he knew himself to be guilty. But you note how the psalm begins, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of what? Thy tender mercies. God's faithful in his mercies toward his own and his mercies to blot out his transgressions. David would have lived under the forbearance of God and waited upon the Lord in his mercies to accomplish his salvation through that seed that God had promised should come. And he said that God would be just to condemn him. You can see that in verse 4. Notice, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Any of us knows that were God to deal with us according to our iniquities, who could stand? Notice over in Psalm 130, the same thing that David writes of here when uh, he says in verse 3, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? And notice here he says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. And I believe Psalm 30, Psalm 130, could well be a prayer that our Lord addressed to his Father from the cross that if the Lord should mark the iniquities of his people, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. His prayer was that the Lord might be forgiving for his sake. And we can believe and trust the word that because God is faithful, we're not, but because he's faithful and he has promised mercy to his own. You know, mercy is totally undeserved. It's God not giving us what we do deserve. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Two different ways to look at that. We deserve condemnation, but our hope is that God would be merciful to us for Christ's sake, and that's a good hope. So that's the first point where we see God's faithfulness and how it's revealed. It's through his mercies. And Jeremiah says that we're not consumed. Think about that yourself. Why am I today here rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ and declaring his mercies? Well, it's because he's been merciful to me. And it's because of that that I've not been consumed. God is faithful to his son. Secondly, you see there in verse 22, it says, because his compassions fail not. And then read on to verse 23. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's what we're looking at here. The faithfulness of God in that his compassions fail not. I know he's a sovereign God. And he's just and strict in that justice. But just the fact that we can come before him and not fear condemnation and judgment it's not because God is looking the other way and hiding his face from our sin. No. Here it says that it's because of his compassions 
That speaks there of the love of God. There's that everlasting love of God for his people that will never fail. We fail every day. We tell somebody we love them, and then as soon as they do something, we get mad. And we, we say, well, I hate you. That's not God's love. His love is of old. It's everlasting. And yet it's fresh and new every morning. I love that. The temperature here is getting a little bit fresher in the morning. It's nice just to get up and go out and sit and take a deep breath and think, ah, what a pleasant morning. It's a reminder of the Lord's compassions that fail not and that they are new every morning. We ourselves are such unloving and really unlovely, not just unloving, but unlovely creatures that it's difficult for us to even comprehend a love such as portrayed here, the love of God in Christ. It's always in Christ for his elect. Love begins with God. We didn't love God. We rather hated him, and yet the scriptures say we love him because he first loved us. And his love is unchanging. His love is infinite. So many ways of describing God's love. But again, that pertains to his faithfulness. He's faithful and true to what he has purposed. Nothing that I have done has ever caused God to love me. And nothing that I can do or will do will ever make God to cease to love me. Both of those are true. Nothing I have done has caused God to love me, but on the other hand, because of his faithfulness, nothing that I have done or will do will make God cease to love me. His love will never be removed, such as the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in taking the sin debt. There then justifying, God justified once for all and forever his people, and therein is our hope. He's faithful and true. And that brings us there to verse 23, the last part. God's faithfulness, why we rest in his faithfulness is because it is great. Notice that, great is thy faithfulness. We sing that hymn, great is thy faithfulness. And we hear a lot of preaching, don't we? At least in the world about being exhorted to be faithful stewards and be faithful to the Lord, be careful, be faithful givers, be faithful in worship, be faithful in prayer, and even faithful in holiness. But the question is, what faithfulness? We don't have any. If it depended upon us, God would certainly have to condemn us. But notice here, great is what? Thy faithfulness. This is addressing God himself. We can only look to him and our faithfulness is nothing, but it's his faithfulness toward us that keeps us. And by his grace, if we do worship, if we're enabled to pray and even walk in a manner that is pleasing to him, it's not for anything in us, but it's for Christ's sake. It's because of his faithfulness, not only in saving us, but keeping us. So that even when we fail, not if we fail, but when we fail, when we fall, when we falter, he is faithful. So great is that faithfulness. It is greater than all of our sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. When we talk about God's faithfulness, first of all, he's faithful to himself and his word. Let's remember that. We like to make this all about us. We like to make this about us, but it's all about him. If you look in Isaiah chapter 46, for example, think about God's faithfulness to himself and to his word. That's why we can have a good hope because he's faithful to himself. Here in Isaiah chapter 46, beginning with verse nine, 
It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do what? All my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. You see, there's the purpose of God, and then there's the accomplishing of his purpose. When God purposed to save a people and send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay their sin debt, that purpose had to be worked out in time. Not like some are saying, well, as soon as God purposed it, it was done. No, there was no body before time in which Christ could shed his blood. People talk about him shedding his blood from before the foundation of the world. No, that scripture in Revelation 13 a says, from the foundation or since the foundation of the world. That's where he came and shed his blood. Here he says, I have spoken it, yes, I will also bring it to pass. I will bring it to pass what I purpose. I purpose it and I also will do it. There's where we see his faithfulness is to himself and his word. Secondly, God's faithful to his covenant. There's a covenant that he has made with his son to redeem a people. And that's from everlasting. If you look in Romans chapter 8, and again, this all shows just how great is his faithfulness. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Well, if you start in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Note the word the called, the called out ones according to his purpose that all things work together. They don't work together for good to, to condemn the sinners for whom Christ didn't die, but they do work together for good. It says to them that love God. Who are those that love God? Well, John said we love him because he first loved us. And here it tells us, to them that love God, who are those that love God? To them who are the called according to his purpose. So again, we see his faithfulness in loving sinners and purposing to call them. And he says in verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. When were those that he predestinated conformed to the image of his son? When Christ came and earned and established that righteousness necessary and then laid down his life, that's when these were conformed to the image of his son, made like him, justified, made righteous in him that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. When it says the firstborn, it's talking about have that position of authority as the firstborn, the heir of all things through his work. And moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. This word called means to name. It's like I'm called kin. I'm named kin. Those that he did predestinate, he also named. He named each one. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And whom he called or he named, it says here, them he also justified. When did he justify them? Well, when he died on the cross. When that blood was shed, being now justified by his blood. And whom he justified in his death. Notice, he also glorified. A lot of people say, well, that's still future, isn't it? No. When Christ rose from the grave and ascended on high, he was glorified before the Father. And those for whom he died and rose again and ascended on high are glorified with him. Scriptures say we're 
in our position, seated with him in the heavens. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I love that word free. Freely. God's faithful to what he purposed to do in his covenant love to his son. And that's the third way he's faithful then to sum it up. He's faithful to his son. We're beneficiaries if we're in his son. But his faithfulness is first of all to his son. And because he promised his son that of all that the father gave him, he should lose nothing. Look over there in Luke chapter 6 or John chapter 6 and verses 37 to 39. You'll see this, how he's faithful to his son. The Lord says here, all that the Father giveth me, what shall come to me? People wonder, well, how do I know I've been given to Christ? Have you come to him? Have you come to him as he is in his word? Has his spirit drawn you? Here it says, And him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. Why will he not cast out a sinner that comes to him? Because that sinner was given of the Father to come to him. If I invite you over to my house and then I send a vehicle to pick you up and bring you, you don't have to sit there wondering, well, I wonder if he really wants me to come. Now he does the calling, he does the drawing. And he says, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me. Notice that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. Oh, great is God's faithfulness to himself, to his word, and to his son. And I believe that was Jeremiah's comfort. Even as we come back to my text there in Jeremiah chapter 3, this was his comfort. This was his hope. And I will tell you, it is a good hope when the Lord is pleased to remind us of his faithfulness and his mercies that are renewed every morning. And they're renewed because great is his faithfulness. And then you see, fourthly, where Jeremiah goes on and speaks of the Lord being his portion. And he says, therefore will I hope in him. Verse 24, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. This is the fourth way in which God manifests his faithfulness in the, that he is the portion of those that he has purposed to bless in his mercy and grace. The Lord spoke unto Aaron over in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20 when he told him you, that Aaron would have no inheritance in the land and neither shalt thou have any part among them. And then he told Aaron, I am thy part and thine inheritance. Aaron representing those that God has been pleased to make to be believer priests through the death of his son. And therefore, the Lord himself is our portion when we have nothing else and are separated out from this world. He's our father, he's our husband, he's our brother, he's our friend, and he has undertaken to be everything that we need. Christ is all I need all I need, our, our portion, our part, and our inheritance. That's where Paul, writing to the Corinthians there, in Corinthians chapter 1, and 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, when it speaks of Christ, you can't add one thing to what Christ has been made unto his people, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us what? Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And then two more here in Lamentations 3. I mentioned six ways that God manifests his faithfulness. Here's the fifth. 
when he says here in verse 25, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeketh him. The grace of God does not leave us passive. And where God proves his faithfulness to us, oh, how our soul is drawn out to him. And we see then in his faithfulness that he is good unto them that wait for him. It doesn't refer to his goodness in general to his creatures whereby they breathe his air and they, he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. Here it's speaking of him being good unto them that he causes to wait for him and that their soul seeks him. Do you suppose there could ever be found one who sincerely waited upon God and sought his mercy in Christ and called upon him for mercy who did not receive this grace? I know some think that. They say, I'm crying unto the Lord, but I just don't have peace. Well, you wouldn't be crying unto the Lord had he not put his spirit in you and you're crying unto him because he is faithful to those that wait for him and whose soul seeks him. And then, sixthly, verse 26, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That's what our Lord did. As he went to the cross to bear the sin of his people, he was waiting upon his Father quietly and knowing that having fulfilled all that the Father gave him to do, that the Father would honor his work in saving his people. But these last five words that we see here could also be expressive of what Jonah cried when Jonah was swallowed by that great fish. What did he cry? Salvation is of the Lord. Isn't that what we read here? We rejoice in his mercy. We rejoice in his love. We rejoice in his faithfulness. We re rejoice in his sufficiency in all things, his goodness. But here in these last five words, we have the whole matter summed up, don't we? Salvation is of the Lord. When people want to argue with you and think, well, doesn't it require some part of man? Our only part is sin. What we know is that we're, our hope is in the faithfulness of God alone. This is the true hope of the believer, one made so by God. And it is of the Lord, salvation in its purposing, it's of the Lord in its execution, and it's of the Lord in its application. And it's of the Lord in his sustaining power in keeping every one that he's purposed to save. Well, I hope that's helpful. God's faithfulness, not only to his word, but to his son, and therefore to those that, those sinners that he has given to his son. Great is his faithfulness. Amen.